Well, good morning and welcome to the Lord's House this morning. Apologies, we're starting just a moment too late. A few other things have been uh, requiring our attention this morning. But good to have you here. Uh, we come together uh, to worship Almighty God. And I know that we come this morning uh, a very different uh, tone across our nation, obviously, with the passing of Queen Elizabeth II on Thursday. And we're going to sing our opening hymn this morning and then we're going to read God's word and uh, indeed uh, have a moment of silence and prayer then uh, for uh, giving thanks to God for her life and commending our new king onto the Lord in prayer, commending our nation and indeed the world at this time as it moves the passing of Queen Elizabeth. So we're going to stand and sing one of our worship group to come and uh, lead us uh, in our worship this morning as we stand and sing our opening hymn. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired us, cheered us on our way. And so we stand and we'll sing this as our opening hymn. Thank you. We know that 
Uh, the scriptures speak of situations where monarchs and they have died and passed away and their lives have been celebrated, their lives have been commemorated and uh, then we know that indeed we are to pray for those in authority over us. And that's what we read about in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4 where Paul says these words to Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And certainly one of the things that has been evident over the past number of days, indeed, has been the life and the witness of Queen Elizabeth to, uh, to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she's made it clear on many occasions, uh, indeed, that uh, Jesus Christ is the only saviour uh, for sinners, that he's the only one able to save. And she referred so many times to her own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we want to thank God for that. Indeed, for her life, for her faith, um, and say we do want as well this morning to pray uh, for our new king, for King Charles III. But we also want to remember the royal family as they mourn, because they mourn the loss, the passing of a mother, dear mother, grandmother, great grandmother, and, and so many other things to say the royal uh, household. And indeed, we want to pray for them and pray for our nation, we pray for the Commonwealth. And uh, pray for the world at this time as many say more in the passing of Queen Elizabeth. We're going to take a moment then to ask you to stand as we indeed uh, for an act of remembrance and then I pray after a minute or so. So let's all stand and let's give thanks to God. Our Father in heaven, as we bow before you today, we come to thank you that you are the one who reigns over all. That you're the one who reigns sovereignly, you're the without beginning, without ending, you're the unchanging God. And we come to thank you, Father, for your love for this world. We come to thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the gospel. And we thank you for forgiveness for all who trust in him. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your concern for this world, your concern for the nations of this world. And you're the one, our Father, who raises up leaders. And uh, Father, we know, Lord God, that as well, the, that they are the same as everyone else, that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. So, Father, we come today to thank you for the life of Queen Elizabeth II. We come, our Father, to thank you for. Uh, Father, for her reign for so, so many years over the United Kingdom and over the Commonwealth. We come, our Father, today to thank you for her life and service as Queen. We thank you, Father, for her example, for her love, her Father, for all her people. We thank you, Father, for her humility. We thank you, Father, for her leadership. We think of how she has been monarch, her Father, for so many years. Prime Ministers down through the years and so many other world leaders, our Father, that 
and her common of God. Thank you, Father, for her faith. Father, for her acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Saviour of sinners. Father, for her own trust in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to pray, Father, that, uh, Lord God, that this will continue to speak on. We come to pray, Father, that in these days, that as a nation will mourn, our Father, that as indeed as the Commonwealth mourns, and people across this world, our Father, that people, our Father, will be reminded of the truth of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father, how it is appointed unto all men once to die, but after this the judgment. Lord, we do pray that you will bless the royal family at this time in particular as they mourn the passing of a dear mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. And our Father, we know so many other things, Lord, to the royal household, and to all our Father who were friends. We come, our Father, to pray that they, O oh God, will turn to you in these days and know that you are the God of all comfort. And that you will walk with them, our Father, through this time of sorrow and great grief for them. We come, our Father, as well, to commend unto you, Lord God, our, our new King. To pray, Father, for King Charles III, and to pray, Father, your blessing to be upon him. And indeed, our Father, our prayer is that as he would, uh, Lord, be king over the, the nation and the commonwealth, our Father, that he indeed would, would look unto you, Lord, and be trusting in you. We ask, our Father, that you'll give him great wisdom and great help. We pray, our Father, that you will help him, Lord, through these days of transition, and as indeed he continues to mourn the passing of his, his dear mother. We pray, Father, that you'll bless uh, uh, Charles and, and Camilla. We commend them to you, the king and queen consort. We pray, Father, they'll know your blessing in their lives. We ask, our God, that you will... Uh, take this nation forward. We pray, our Father, that it will be ever mindful, Lord God, that righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We thank also, our Father, of a new Prime Minister, our Father, who has stepped into office, Lord, throughout this past week as well. We command this trust to you, Lord, and pray your blessing upon her. And we ask, our Father, for those in the cabinet, and our Father, for those who are all in authority over us, we pray for them in these days, that they would look unto you and seek you in these days. Lord God, that each of them, Lord, as well, will be saved and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that at this sad time for our nation, and yet a time, our Father, of moving forward with the new King, we come to thank you that we can look to the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for him, for how he, uh, Father, reigns over our lives, and we pray, O oh God, that in these days, that this will be a time of turning unto him. For Father, we're reminded in Scripture that every knee shall bow before him. And Lord God, that all will acknowledge that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And may it be, our Father, that when all bow before him, that they will hear, enter into the, 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 the presence of, 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 of heaven for all of eternity. And the Father, that there will not be people who will hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. So Father, bless our nation, our land. I say the Commonwealth and across this world at this time. And again, we give thanks to you, our Father, for all of your help and pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we come to the announcements this morning, I do ask you to bear with me. Uh, George is not with us here today, and I think he's picked a good Sunday not to be here. Uh, because uh, I have a long list of announcements. Uh, I know there was last week as well. It's that time of the year. Many things are recommencing. And uh, therefore, I ask you to say, bear with me as I run through the announcements and uh, hopefully make everything as clear as possible. We do give you all a warm welcome. We welcome those who are watching online as well and, and thank them for, for watching in. And uh, we trust that we'll know God's blessing uh, to be upon us today. Do you remember the Lord's table immediately after for those who are saved? And uh, we're commanded to remember the Lord in his own appointed way. So do please uh, stay for the Lord's table if you can uh, this morning. If you
you're a believer. Uh, do remember also then this evening at uh, 6 o'clock is a fellowship night and Luke and Emily will be responsible for that as they share of their trip to Lanzarote. I know they were to do it about a month or so ago um, but uh, weren't able to do that at the last moment and uh, we uh, do encourage you to come out tonight and hear of that. Uh, Emily will also be sharing a little bit about the Holiday Bible Club that she was leading down in Clover the week whenever we had coaching for Christ here. Uh, so do come along for that and for the time of fellowship, for the tea and coffee all afterwards. Wednesday evening is our Bible study and prayer meeting. Again, we invite you along to I want to say a big thank you to all who came out on Wednesday evening as we particularly focus on young families. Tremendous response. We want to thank you for that. And uh, in our prayer meetings, we'll continue to pray for families and continue to pray for all the needs of the church and, and in these days. So therefore, so do uh, make Wednesday night a priority and come along and be part of it and what God is doing in these days. Friday evening, uh, we'll see the recommencement. I, I know it's a time many people, I'm sure, do, do we do things, do we not? Some have made decisions uh, not to, to, to hold things on at this time, but uh, I, I know with other churches, they uh, also are going ahead with different things and are cancelling some things, say, uh, 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 with regards to the passing of, of the Queen. And uh, Friday night, we'll see the recommencement of our Friday Club. Uh, and it'll be at 6.45 p.m., that's for all primary school children, so we uh, want to see them along on Friday night for that. And then BYF, uh, well, they will be meeting at 8 o'clock there on Friday night as well. That's for all our young people of high school age and up. Saturday night, God willing, there'll be a, a young adults barbecue at the manse. And uh, for those in that sort of 18 plus group, uh, uh, we would love you to come along. If you're coming to that, will you please message Heather or myself by Thursday uh, to confirm that you're coming. I haven't put a list out. There's a number of other lists we're going to hear about that are out in the ports uh, and needing sign. Uh, so if you could just message us. I know quite a number have said they're not going to be about next weekend, but we still would like to go ahead with that. And for catering purposes, we would uh, like to know who's coming. Also, Shane Dean of Baptist Missions, um, he will be along to share uh, testimony. He's from Passage West in Cork, as we serve in the Lord, and he'll be along just to share a short testimony on Saturday evening. Next uh, Sunday, 11 o'clock, God willing, I'll be preaching in the morning, 6 p.m., our evening service. We're going to have a testimony, a special testimony from Paul McAdam. Uh, he is a church planter and also now the pastor of Keeley Baptist Church. And uh, which was recently formed, and Paul uh, will be coming to share his testimony and share a bit about uh, Keeley Baptist Church next Sunday evening. Um, BB, uh, please note that the Tuesday registration is cancelled. Um, the Queen was indeed the patron of the Boys' Brigade, and therefore uh, the all Boys' Brigade activities are cancelled until after. Uh, the Queen's funeral and also the GB uh, was to recommence this Thursday evening but it has also been cancelled or put back until the following Thursday the 22nd. You will see in, the, uh, in your views this morning there are these envelopes, uh, the monthly offering uh, is for Baptist women now it's not for our own uh, BWF, uh, it's for the, uh, the Baptist women to do with the association, Gail Curry is over all of that and we've set aside this month uh, for that department of the work. So if you can give to that, please take the envelope and please then return it over the next number of weeks. BWF, our own ladies, um, uh, to start the new year of ladies meetings, a meal has been organised for Monday, the 26th of September, in the water margin of Cool Rain at 7 pm. If you'd like to go, please put your name on the list in the porch. And uh, you can either meet the ladies there uh, at 6 50, or if you require transport, meet here at the church uh, for 6 o'clock. So, ladies, uh, that'll be a good way to start off uh, the new season. And so, if you're leaving this morning, do please uh, put your name on that list or this evening uh, if you can. And I'll say that's uh, for the ladies. Crash, we're hoping to get the crash up and running again with a router. Uh, supervised crash and uh, we know normally it's just been uh, a parent who's normally taken their own child out since the, uh, we returned after Covid but we would like a route so that both parents could be in the service and uh, say their children are being supervised out in the crash room and uh, if you could help with that in any way at all uh, or if you help with that please 
again, there's a list in the ports. Put your name on that. You know, you need to be 18 plus uh, to be able to supervise. I know sometimes we do involve others who are a bit younger, but uh, the, the main leaders have to be 18 plus. And uh, also, we'll also, so we'll up, we need to do access NI forms. And um, that will actually, if there's anybody in the church that hasn't had an access NI form done uh, uh, and is involved in children's work, youth work, um, done within the last three years, I think it is, um, we'll, we'll just double check that. You need to see Sarah as soon as possible, and she'll get you the relevant forms and uh, be able to look after that then uh, for you. And I say that is vital to the work of the church here for the safeguarding of our children and indeed for us all as a church. Um, Draperstown Presbyterian Church, uh, there's an evening of gospel music this coming Friday night featuring True Country Gospel Band. Also involved will be uh, James Strange and Testify, uh, John Porter, and uh, that's not the John from here, as George said last week, it's a different John Porter, and it's in Draperstown Presbyterian Church this coming Friday night at 8 o'clock, and all proceeds and donations to missionaries, including Gary and Mary Reed in Kenya. So you're all invited to that, and say all the details you'll find on their Facebook page as well. Um, amazing journey, and uh, we mentioned that on Wednesday evening. God willing, amazing journey will come uh, to us at the beginning of November, the 7th to the 11th. We we'll need helpers for that, and uh, just so you put it in the diary, we'll be during the daytime going into the schools, and uh, I'll have more details about that then next, next Sunday. I felt this morning we'd have enough on without going through exactly what it involves and who. Uh, what different people can do and uh, say we'll, we'll have that next week but you can put it into your diary so that you can uh, hopefully if you need a bit of time of work or organize things so that you can be involved in that we need as much help as possible and then one final announcement i think we've been through them well here um i've been asked to announce a book of condolence with regards to the passing of queen elizabeth uh, is there will be one in Kilcronaghan Parish Church and uh, it will be open on Wednesday evening from 7 to 8 p.m. and also Saturday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. and if anybody would like to go and sign that uh, they can do so at those times. I think these are all the necessary announcements. I hope I haven't forgotten anything and uh, we do is always make them subject to uh, the Lord's will. Now boys and girls, I know uh, you've been keen to go out to Sunday school I don't think you have the same treat as you would have got last week, but yet I know that uh, you'll have a good time in Sunday school. And uh, before you go out to Sunday school, um, we're going to sing our offering hymn. And uh, it's this beautiful hymn, The Lord's my shepherd, I will not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still water. His goodness restores my soul. During the singing of this hymn, say the men will lift the offering in appropriate time. As soon as the set will stand, the same will remain the same. Thank you. Thank you.
But as far as we begin this study, we're going to go a little deeper than that. In order that we may understand something of the culture of the Philippian church. So that we grasp an idea here of who he's writing to. Of his reasons for writing. And then we'll also look a little bit of how the church was founded. And the man himself. So often you see, we can just accept that what we read, because it is from the Bible, we just assume that it's true. Simply for that reason, simply because it's the Bible, you get told it every Sunday, it's God's word, it's true. And while that is the case, as we begin reading through this letter together, it's helpful to remember that this was written by an historical person to a historical church in a particular historical period. And so in order for us to be able to apply it to our values, we must understand something of the context into which Paul was writing and his reasons for writing. So let's start at the beginning. It's always a good place to start, isn't it? How did this church come about? How was it formed? Well, the church in Philippi was founded by Paul in the early 50s of the first century AD. And this can be read about in Acts 16. And rather than me just tell you lots of different things that can be read about in that chapter, we're going to read it together in just a moment. So if you want to turn on your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. At the time of writing, probably in the early 60s AD, Paul was in prison. And he had just received a monetary gift from the Philippian church through a man named Epaphroditus. But for now, let's turn to Acts chapter 16 this morning and we'll read it together. We'll read the full chapter together. Acts chapter 16, beginning the reading of verse 1. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul went to Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Fergia and Galicia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they came up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging them and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, set a sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and our own colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had the spirit of divination and brought her with her much gain 
by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when our rulers saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the market place before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with robots. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stones. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them in the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And then, when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and the party. Amen. So how did Paul end up in Philippi? Well, Paul made the decision to travel to Macedonia and thus Philippi in obedience to a vision. We've read in verses 6 to 10 of Acts 16 that Paul had a God-given vision in the night where a man from the province of Macedonia called him to come to them and help them. And what was verse 10 say? And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I think before we go any further in our study this morning, there's a challenge there laid down in verse 10. The immediate obedience of Paul when the others are with him to go and to follow God's call on their life. One well-known Christian writer and preacher by the name of David Jeremiah says, Whatever God tells you to do, 
burden that you think of. Perhaps you've been feeling for some time that God is calling you to do something for him. Perhaps you're only now feeling as though God is calling you to serve him in some way. You could be going abroad with the gospel that God called Paul to. Or it could be signing up to help with the praise team, with the crash, in Sunday school, the youth club, or some of the other departments in the church. Perhaps you've been feeling that God has been calling you into full-time Christian service for all to the better term. That he's calling you to leave behind your work. To leave behind your job security, your financial security, and to trust in him and follow him to the Bible college. That doesn't mean you make impulse decisions based upon your own thinking. <coughs> to help discern if it is of God, talk to someone in leadership in the church. Talk over where you feel God is calling you. But if God is indeed calling you, then heed the advice of David Jeremiah. Follow Paul's example. And whatever God tells you to do, do it immediately. Acts 16 tells us that that is what Paul did, that he left and at once he headed for the province of Macedonia. They set sail from Troas to the port of Neapolis, and then they made their way to the city of Philippi. Now we're going to try and get an image into our heads of what this place was like as a city. So it was strategically located, it spilled down a mountainside onto a fertile, well-watered plain. And it was about 10 miles inland from the port of Neapolis where they would have landed. And there was a route known as the Ignatian Way. And this was a road that linked the city of Rome with its eastern provinces. And it passed right through the heart of the city. This was a route that was vital for business and commerce. And the fact that it passed through the heart of Philippi made the city all the more important. And when they arrived there, they made their way to where the Bible tells us they supposed there was a place of prayer. And there were a small number of Jewish women there. We've read of a number of people over Paul's time in Philippi who came to faith. And so Paul established the church there before the local magistrates eventually ordered that they leave. But when they went on their way, they left behind a diverse group of believers, among whom was this wealthy lady of Lydia and her household, along with the Philippian jailer and his family. And these are some of the people in the church that Paul would have been writing this letter to. But who else lived in the city? Well, there have been a number of battles around 30 to 40 years before the birth of Christ. And so a large number of the Philippian people were the descendants of some of the soldiers that had settled there and lived in Philippi after these battles. So uh, the common language in the province was Greek. Latin was the language that was spoken in Philippi due to this history. And it was a Roman colony, and Acts 16 told us that becoming part of the Roman Empire in 167 BC, and that's very important. Because that meant that that city of Philippi enjoyed all of the privileges that being a Roman colony brought with it. It was a city that proudly maintained the Roman character, and being a Roman colony meant that Roman law was used in local affairs. Sometimes it even included exemption from taxation. But alongside this, their whole way of life was affected by achieving this title. Everything from ownership to transfer of land, enforcement of law, it was as if they were actually living on Italian soil, operating under Roman rule. And so there was much civic pride within the city. They were proud of their heritage, and as a result, worship of the Roman Emperor was integral to religious life within the city. However, 
Not all the people within the city were secular minded emperor worshippers. The narrative that we read in Acts 16 bears witness to the presence of a small Jewish community, as we've already mentioned, before the arrival of the Christian missionaries. But why do I mention all of this? Why do you need to know it all? Well, as, it, well, as I'll mention again later, I hope you see how it's essential that we get an understanding of the context in terms of the recipients of the letter, who they were, what Philippi was like, in order for us to understand some of the things that Paul addresses in this letter. Another question we must ask that perhaps at first we may think is irrelevant, but hopefully you'll see in a moment why it's not, is the argument where this letter was actually written from. You see, this is the main area of background and historical context that scholars are in debate over. And don't worry, we're not going to go into all the arguments now because there are books upon books written about it. But we do need to summarise it. You see, the most likely place that Paul was imprisoned, based upon the evidence, is the city of Rome itself. The other two alternative options presented are Caesarea and in Ephesus, however, the arguments for those two locations in comparison are relatively weak. And many scholars take the position that Rome is where Paul is writing from. I won't go into all of the reasoning this morning, but just one or two things to mention. Paul speaks in Philippians 1 verse 13 of how it has become known throughout the whole imperial yard that his imprisonment is for Christ. The imperial yard would have been stationed in Rome there would have been other elements of it in other cities, but the language used implies that it was most likely Rome. One commentator strongly says that other arguments should actually just be dropped from consideration. But why have we all this? Why does it matter to us here in October more in 2022? Well, one writer points out that a different geographical setting and thus a different chronological setting. That changes our understanding entirely of who Paul's opponents were at the time. And therefore it affects how we understand his writings in light of the situation that he found himself in. I was doing a, a good bit of reading around this letter this week and I'm paraphrasing uh, a paragraph here that I feel summarises the importance of this letter quite well. <coughs> 2,000 years ago, a tent maker was thrown into prison for creating a public disturbance. And now, all these years later, the name of the emperor at the time is the less recognisable of the two. While Nero himself was a prolific author, none of his writings remain. And yet, this tent maker, who we know to be the Apostle Paul, his name is instantly recognised globally. There are millions of copies in many different languages of his letter to the Philippian church and of his other letters in circulation today. Now the time has come, one writer says, when people call their dogs Nero and their sons Paul. And so with all of that in the background, with all of this groundwork done, the foundations are laid we can see why this is where Paul began his first evangelistic effort in Macedonia. Here in Philippi, where he would go on to establish the first Christian church in Europe. And now we're going to spend the remaining few minutes of our time just looking at the opening two verses of the letter of Philippians as we begin this new series together. So if you could flick over from Acts 16 in your Bibles, Philippians chapter 1, we'll read together. Can I just say when you're finding your place, don't be getting worried, we'll not be uh, spending 15 months doing background and context work every week in this series. But I do feel that it's beneficial for us as we start out in this new series of the that this sermon is more of an introduction to the series. So let's read Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 together. Paul and Timothy 
servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. These opening two verses are very similar to many of Paul's letters in the sense that he begins with this greeting, he identifies himself and his co-worker, and then in verse 2 he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to comment much on this verse other than to say that this is a warm greeting of encouragement and comfort. It speaks of the unity that they have together as it's called our Father. He's the Father of the Philippian church and he's Paul and Philippi's Father. If you're a Christian here this morning, he's your Father as well. And this is the unity that brings us all together. I want to comment just a little more on verse 1 just for a moment. But right at the outset, this letter is identified as coming from Paul and Timothy. We know Paul to be their leader. But the key theme of this letter is joy. Joy. Paul has a joy that is evident throughout the letter. Despite his circumstances that we've been looking at already this morning. At the time of writing, we've already established that he's in prison. Probably in Rome. Does that mean he's happy? Probably not. But is he joyful? Absolutely. You see, happiness, as we define it so often, is a feeling. It's so often based upon circumstances. One writer says it can only be experienced if and when our circumstances are favourable. And therefore it's not guaranteed. It's elusive and it's uncertain. And that's why there's such a need to distinguish between happiness and joy. Spiritual joy does not depend on chance or circumstance. It's so much more than that. It's so much more deep rooted than that. It's a total confidence in and a total reliance upon God regardless of circumstances. And it's knowing that He is with you. As you go through life's struggles, because your hope and your salvation is found in Him alone. Part of the reason, perhaps, for, such, for joy being such an evident theme here in this letter is the joy that the Philippian church's love brought to Paul. They sent him numerous gifts on different occasions, and they always supported him. And their concern for his welfare while he was in prison had brought him great joy. He wanted to, in turn, share his joy with them, the joy that he had in the Saviour Jesus Christ. I know that that's a joy that many of you here this morning have. You know the Lord Jesus is your own personal saviour. You've come and you've put your faith and your trust in him. But there may also be someone here or somebody watching online. And for you, you know that this isn't the case. You know that Jesus Christ is not Lord of your life. Because you never came in repentance before him. You never asked him forgiveness. You never bowed the knee to him as king. Let me tell you this morning that he loves you. Jesus Christ gave himself as a sacrifice on the cross to take the punishment that you and I deserve. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12 that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for what? For the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross, despising the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him. He did it so that God's great plan of salvation could be carried out because he took the punishment for sin in our place. Did it for you and I. Can I ask you this morning, have you come to him? Have you acknowledged him as Lord? He's 
king of kings, he's lord of lords, but is he king of your life? You know, we've seen over the last number of days a new monarch on the earthly throne that rules over the UK. A new king is on the throne. And if you were to enter into the presence of a royal thing, you'd be expected to bow you. The Bible tells us that one day we bow the knee before the King of Kings. The Bible says that every knee will bow, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I've said it before in the last few weeks, and I'll say it again. On that day, it won't matter how big the throne is. No matter how many cattle you have. No matter what the bank statement said was in the account. It won't matter how popular you are in the community or in school. It won't matter the size of the house that you live in, the type of car that you drove. It won't matter what designer clothes you wear. None of it will matter. Why? Because none of it goes with you. The only thing that will matter is the answer to this question. What have you done with Jesus? Will it be said of you that you rejected him and you went your own way? Will you turn to him and follow him and live to serve him? There are many here this morning who have done that. Paul had done that. Paul's desire in them was to serve his king. God used him mightily as he's writing to his are now in our Bibles and are read around the world by millions of people. Paul goes on and he writes here to the Philippian church. He expresses his joy. And notice he does not identify himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's what he was, but he didn't identify himself with that. Paul didn't desire titles or any form of credit to be given to his name. First and foremost, he was a servant of Jesus Christ. The use of the word servant here, or bond servant, as your Bible may, may say, describes willing, determined, and devoted service. The term servant in our language and in our minds can often have a, a negative connotation. It can lead to us thinking of someone being forced to carry out tasks by that they don't want to do all of the instruction of a cruel master. But that's not the case here. That's not what this term means in this context. It's about willful obedience to God and wanting to serve him. We may have expected Paul to use the type of apostle here. As in our eyes, it would have given him more authority. But his close bond with the Philippian church meant that this was unnecessary. In fact, he may even have considered it inappropriate to try to display his authority for them in any way, considering that he was also thanking them for their support for him. He identifies not as one who's an apostle, who's a great teacher, but as one who's a servant, who in willful obedience serves his Lord and his King. Could that same language be used to describe us this morning? Do we identify ourselves as servants of Jesus Christ? Do we have an attitude of willful obedience towards him? In the context that Paul was writing in, there would have been unmistakable tones of humility and submission. Heaven can use this language. Do we humbly submit to the will and the authority of God? When you become a Christian, there should be a change in attitude in your life. There should be fruit evident, as the Bible talks about. The fruit of a life committed to following Christ should become more and more evident. We have an increasing awareness of God's will and the desire to do it. This is what is called sanctification, the process of becoming more and more obedient to God's will as He changes you more and more into the likeness of his son. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 7, Paul writes that Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, or in some versions it will say servant. This is the same word that is used here. 
Paul considered the position that he and Timothy had as servants of Christ Jesus as a tremendous privilege, a tremendous high calling. You see, it's a high calling to have the same position taken by Christ as we've read in chapter 2. So Paul's conclusion is this, if Jesus Christ is Lord, then we're his servants. We have served him. What a privilege that is. We are servants this morning if you're a Christian here. We are servants of the King of Kings. Surely that's cause for praise and worship this morning. That God will be pleased to use us, his servants. That's what the Hebrew form of this word means that was used in the Old Testament. It was used for Moses and a number of the prophets. It denoted their authority as God-given and God-accredited messengers. So to be a servant also means that you were chosen by God. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel this morning, knowing that the God who created the world, who spoke everything into existence, how does it make you feel knowing that you're a Christian here this morning, you chose you. He chose you before the foundation of the world to put your faith in him. So it makes me feel privileged. Makes me want to praise and worship my God and my King. It makes me excited to serve him in my life. Open to you. Are you not excited at this? Do you not recognize the privilege of this? Thing? No one would also recognize the responsibility of this. The world around us, they're watching. They're watching how we serve. They're watching to see just how willful our obedience really is to our King. Or sometimes we do things half heartedly. And I think there's a, a real challenge to us here if we seek to live for our King and seek to serve Him. In all that we do. As we close this morning, I just want to ask once again, is he your king? We've been thinking so much in all of our minds about kingship this weekend, but is the king of kings king of your life? If you ask him to come into your life, to change you and to transform you, if you handle your life fully over to him, He's either Lord of all your life or he's not Lord of all. Which is it for you? I pray that you'd be able to say that he is your king today. And that you can say that your hope is found in Christ alone. Amen. Thank you so much indeed a challenge to, to all of our hearts here today and indeed what a privilege it is that we are able to serve the King of Kings. And we're going to sing our closing hymn in Christ alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Thank you.
Father, we thank you for your word to our hearts today. We thank you for the Apostle Paul, his obedience to you. Thank you for saving him. Thank you for how you gifted him. Thank you, Father, for his courage as well to take forth the gospel into Europe. And Father, today we are the recipients of him bringing the, the gospel first into Europe. Father, may we be thankful. But Father, we thank you, Lord God, for, uh, for the privilege of being able to serve you. And perhaps, our Father, it is that you want us to take the gospel to somebody, perhaps even for the very first time. May we live in obedience to you. Father, may we proclaim the gospel to all around us. And indeed, Father, if you're asking us to go further afield, may there be that obedience within our hearts. So, Father, bless your word for the unsaved, Lord. May today they come and put their trust in the Saviour. May they do so before they even leave here. And, you know, God, they'd go home with a joy. Uh, that they've never experienced before within their hearts. So, Father, bless those who must leave us now, go with them. And for those of us who continue to remain on around the Lord's table, your blessing be upon us. For Roger, as he brings your word to our hearts, may, Father, it be a blessed and precious time together. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.